All right, so like I said, we're going to reflect on uh, the last year a little bit today, and it's kind of crazy to think of the fact that 23 is now over. Uh, time seemed to fly fast for, for me. I know some of you probably it felt like the year dragged on. Um, some of you are excited to leave 2023 behind you. Some of you had the most epic year of your life in 2023, and you're like, oh, I hope 2024 is better. So I don't know where you're at and what your situation is for everybody, but regardless of where you're coming from, I, I'm going to talk a little bit today using God's Word, of course, and reading through God's Word. We're going to look at, at using the experiences of 2020-23 as we look ahead into 2024. Now, as I think about it, there are different people have a different way of approaching the year. Some of you, some of you are the people that are the driven people. Your approach is you're already looking down the road at 2024. You aren't even thinking about 2023. It's like, it's like, I got to keep going. I got to keep pushing. I got to keep driving. You're the people that are, you probably love the saying that says something like, the reason the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror is because you need to keep focused on moving ahead. You got to keep going. You're probably also the people that would say the best is yet to come because you're always believing that God is going to do something big in the future. There's always something to work for, forward to. You're probably very goal-driven. Now, there's others that are, are looking ahead, and you're looking ahead because, uh, and constantly looking forward because you don't want to deal with this pain that's behind you. There's some sort of hurt that you've experienced, and you don't want to think about it. You don't want to dwell on it. And, and so rather than address or deal with what's happened, you're just going to keep looking ahead so you can just ignore what has happened behind you. Now, there's another people, a group of people, and I, I hope this isn't any of you, but it may be some of you, that this is your approach, the constantly looking ahead and not willing to stop and look back because you've misunderstood what the Bible says. You've taken passages like in, in Luke 9, where Jesus said something along the lines of, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. And you say, see, Jesus says don't look behind you, always look ahead. Or, or you remember Lot's wife, the story of Lot and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, as Lot and his wife are leaving Sodom, and uh, she's going, and they're told not to look back. And then she looks back, and she turns into a pillar of salt. And you're like, see, God doesn't want us looking back. He always wants us looking straight ahead. Always push ahead. Don't think about the past. Now, that's some of you that are, that are the inclined as well in that way. But for whatever reason, there's people who are constantly looking to the future. And you're not alone, and I won't single you out and say that it's bad necessarily because that's the group I fall in um, to a fault at times, where I don't take time to celebrate what's happened in the past. It's part of the reason we haven't taken time to recognize people for reading through the Bible in a year, or, or for being consistent in their, their walk with God, because it's like, okay, great, you did that last year, but what are you doing tomorrow? And, and I'm the first one to say that's not a healthy approach, but it's the way I tend to fall into things, constantly pushing ahead. Now, there's another group of people um, in, in this, besides the ones that are looking ahead, they're the ones that are constantly living in the past. They're, they can be for a variety of reasons. Uh, recently, I had a conversation with a person, uh, and this conversation with this person went something along the lines of, and I'm going to change the details a little bit to protect the innocent, but it's not anybody here. Um, it was, uh, I'm frustrated, Sam, because more than four decades ago, I was an all-state athlete. Why am I not being recognized? This other person who was an all-state athlete in that same decade, they get credit for what they did, but why don't I get credit for what I did? Again, more than four decades ago. They're stuck living in what happened in the past, and at this point, in the distant past. So that's where some people are. They're living their glory days that have... have passed them by and have moved on. There's also the person who has gotten stuck in the past due to a hardship or a loss. This is that person that maybe a marriage fell apart, someone close to them died, there was a business that blew up, and they just haven't been able to move past that tragedy, that, that thing that impacted them 
in their past. An example of this would be a, a person that, again, that I know, and this person had a situation where, again, decades ago, their business blew up. Things went wrong. They lost pretty much everything of financial means. And throughout the rest of that person's life, they were left with that feeling of, I just am not capable of succeeding. I am not going to be what I once was. Clearly, I, I don't know what I'm doing because I failed this one time back four decades ago, three decades ago. And if I failed then, I'm going to fail again, and so I'm stuck. Now, I want to pause here and just say, if this is, is where you're at, let me encourage you that, that you're not alone. And let me also encourage you that there are people that can walk through this with you, and that I would strongly suggest get a hold of myself or get a hold of Jamie Peterson, and uh, we would be happy to work and walk through this with you. Sometimes it's not, not even in that situation. You just need a mentor or somebody, a trusted friend that you can open up to and walk through this with. But that is another group of people that get stuck in the past because of past failures. And there's other reasons that people get stuck in the past. Like I said, this isn't going to be an all-inclusive list. But if you are one who finds yourself living in the past, you are not alone because um, we've seen plenty of people. And like I said, I know somebody close to me that has been in that situation. Now, over the next two weeks, this week and next week, we are going to uh, talk about foundations. And we're going to talk about how to, to what it looks like to move forward. And today we're going to take a look at how the, at times we have to look at what's behind us before we can move forward. In fact, the, the main point that I have on your notes there is it's hard to move forward in a healthy way when we don't take time to intentionally reflect, at least occasionally, on what's happened in the past. It's hard to move forward in a healthy way when we don't take time to intentionally reflect, at least occasionally, on what's happened in the past. Now that could sound like some feel-good self-help, and um, self-help isn't very helpful if it's not based on truth. So let's go to God's Word, and then we'll take a look at something that we see there. Now, before I get to that, I want to go back to the quote that I said that, that the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror. It's true, the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror. But if you've driven any amount of time, you know the value of a mirror and seeing what's behind you. I can remember more than one occasion driving and looking up in my mirror and seeing something barreling down on us and having to move over so that that thing didn't run through us. You need your mirror to see things that have happened, to be able to still live in the present. You need the benefit of the past to live your best present. In um, Psalms chapter 77, we see uh, this, an example of this. Now, I wanted to see, because this made sense to me, and I thought, well, that's great, but is this even biblical, or is this just meaningless self-help? And uh, thought about remembering. And so I had this idea of, let's see how many times the Bible talks about remembering. Uh, and so in this psalm, Psalm 77, the word that's translated remember, I took a look at it and said, okay, how many times is that word used? It's used 230 plus times. And that's just one word translated remember. There's also the, the words that aren't Hebrew that are in the Greek in the New Testament. And so my point is, the Bible has a lot to say about remembering. Yes, it has a lot to say about looking forward, but it also has a lot to say about taking a look behind and reflecting on what's happened in the past. In fact, this word for remember, that's kind of the idea of it. It's celebrating what's happened. It's remembering. It's reflecting. That's the, the gist of this word. In Psalm 77, it's on the note sheet. It says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all of your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. The, the psalmist who wrote this starts out the psalms, this psalm talking about all of the hardships that he's going, all of the, the tough times that they're facing, and how bad things are in their life. And then he decides that instead of just remaining in that self-pity, he's going to look back on all that God has done. And as he looks back on all that's done, he sees a God that has been faithful in the past, is faithful in the present, and will be faithful in the future. 
And so with that, Psalm, I want to take out of that this point, is that one of the reasons we need to take time to reflect is to be encouraged. There is encouragement that comes when we look back and see what we've gone through and what we've been brought through. We, it, even when you look back and go, oh, there was this miserable time in my life, when you can see that you got through that miserable time in that, your life, you can be encouraged that if you got through it before, you can get through it again. If you look back and go, oh, I've experienced in a really financial hard time right now. But you can look back and go, wait, I got through one of those. God brought us through faithfully. So if he did it before, why can't he do it again? And there can be some hope and some encouragement in that. Now, maybe, maybe that's not your situation. Maybe that you don't need just that encouragement. Um, I also, as I was preparing, was reminded of a, a situation of a business leader. I love business, if you can't tell. Um, a business leader, and this, this leader of this organization was talking about how successful leaders, most of the time, are not 100% sure of the direction that they're going. Now, we have this misconception that those strong leaders that are out in front are 100% convinced. They absolutely know where they're going. They absolutely know how they're going to get there, and everything is going to fall into place. But that's not at all the case. In fact, this person's estimation is that anytime you can get close to 80% confidence in where you're going, then you should go for it because you're not going to get to a point of absolute certainty about anything until it's already happened. So... What if a person that was looking to move ahead was able to develop confidence based on experiences? What if, what if that person that's leading was able to say, okay, I'm going to go after this. I'm not 100% sure it's going to work, but maybe there's something in the past that has helped me get there. And so there, there's the encouragement of the past, but there's also the, the, the strength that can come with the past. Anyway, uh, this, this, speaking of things that I'm not 100% sure are going to succeed, there's a few of us that are getting ready to launch what we're calling Hope Recovery here at the Rescue Church. And that's a, a 12-step program for not simply addicts, but anybody that's experienced uh, hurts, hang-ups, or, or is dealing with bad habits. And as we've been preparing for this, we're actually getting ready to uh, kind of do our soft launch this coming week. Uh, which means, hey, we're opening it up, but not really screaming it from the mountaintops. And we're going to promote it as February 1st as the start. So if you're thinking about it, you can be in prayer for that, because if God doesn't show up, it's not going to go well. But all of that said, we have done a lot of preparation, and we're moving towards it. Well, in the preparation, we go through all of the steps and, and regularly read through the lessons e that go to, with each step. There's 26 lessons, so We've gone through them, uh, and, and it goes through the 12 steps. 12 steps are similar with any 12-step program, similar to any 12-step program. The difference is in this one, it's like uh, what AA was when it started more than 100 years ago, where, where it was based on Scripture, and so it reflects on the Bible, and it talks a lot as you go through any of these 12-step programs about looking back, and they talk about things like dealing with issues that you've had with people and, and taking a moral inventory of where, where you reflect on your mistakes and, and, and things that you've done and things that have been done to you. In Matthew, we see Jesus talk about things that have been happening in our lives in relationship. And he says this in Matthew 5, 23 through 24. He says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. And then in Matthew 18, 15, he says, If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. Jesus seems pretty clear about relationships, and that if we have an issue with a relationship, that it is our responsibility to go address that issue. We, we like to say in, in the U.S., I don't know if this is big everywhere, but we have this idea that if they have a problem with me, they should come to me. In fact, there's probably many of you in this room that have said something like that, or at least thought it. Maybe you, you wouldn't say it out loud, but, but have had the idea, if someone's got an issue with me, they need to come to me with it. 
But Jesus says something differently. He says that if you see that someone has an issue, you need to go to them. He also does say, though, if you have an issue with somebody, you need to go to them. So regardless of what the issue, you need to be taking intentional steps to address it. Now, I will step back into what I was talking about in my hope recovery side of things. And there is a time when it's unhealthy and when you don't want to put yourself in an abusive situation. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there as well. But all of that said, one of the reasons it's important to reflect on the past is to address damaged relationships. To be able to look back and go, oh, something happened this last year, or maybe it's longer, and there's this thing that was said or done or that I said or did, and I need to go back and address it. Now, that's not always the easiest thing to do. I'll say at times that probably will require counseling, uh, especially if it's in your marriage, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. If you need help with somebody working through these issues, maybe it's not a counselor, maybe it's a trusted friend, Um, maybe it's somebody that's a mentor, but don't be afraid to look back and see those relationships and then address them. Now, some people like to say things like, it's in the past, I don't want to relive the past. It can be really hard and I I just want to keep moving forward. But in your moving forward, uh, like I said, we're talking about foundations and what we're building on. And if we haven't addressed those hurts and those issues in the past, you're building on something that's fractured. And I'm not a builder. I don't pretend to be. But anytime that you put something on something that's unstable, there's a good chance that it's going to collapse or fall down, at least have weakness shown down the road. And same is true in our life. If we don't address those things that have happened, if we don't address those, those relationships, there's a great ch- greater chance that it's going to affect us in the future. So if you're one of those people like me that's focused on the future, great. But don't be afraid or don't forget to take a look back and address those things from your past. Now, <clears throat> in uh, 1 Corinthians, we're going to get to a, another thing here that we can learn about the benefits of looking in the past. When, when we look to the past, we, we see Paul here. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, the Apostle Paul is, is writing to the church in Corinth. And he challenges them to remember mistakes made by people in the past and, and learn from the consequences that they've experienced. He says it this way. He says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages Uh, of the ages has come. See, we don't need to keep making the same mistakes that other people have made. If I was to ask you to raise your hand and say, hey, have you made a mistake that no one else has made before? I'm guessing there probably wouldn't be very many hands up because most mistakes have been made by somebody else in some way or another in the past. Yet, we still, for some reason, continue making those mistakes. The we, we can take it away from, from uh, ourselves as individuals and we can look at like a, a church and we can go, they, or, or a business, and why do they keep doing that same thing over and over again? Why do they make that same mistake? A, a government, we can blame a government for making the same mistakes over and over again. But in our own lives, we can often do the same thing. And so part of the reason we need to look back is to learn what we should do and or not do. We need to learn what we should do and what, or what we should not do. And to illustrate this point, let's look at Thomas Edison. Alan might remember Thomas Edison, but the rest of us have not been around that long. Um, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Now, it's not the light bulb as we know it today. Uh, these are all LEDs in here, and uh, he did not have the benefit of an LED back then. But as he was creating the light bulb, the original light bulb, he has a quote that says, I have not failed, I have just found 10,000 ways that did not work. He took that idea that, that I need to keep track of things that don't work so that I can continue to build on them to figure out what will work. 
In our lives, we need to do the same thing sometimes. We need to look back and we need to keep track of what's not working, not so that we can wallow in self-pity and go, oh, that didn't work. Look at me, I'm a failure. But instead to say, wait, this didn't work. What can I do differently in the future? Now, if we don't do that, we fall under, uh, under what another famous person whose name starts with E, Einstein, called insanity. Because we're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We, we don't take the time to say, this didn't work, I'm going to change something. Instead we say, oh, this year will be different. I'm going to try harder. What, what are you going to try harder? Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to try harder. Okay, Here, here's my favorite. I'm going to do better. What does that even mean? I'm going to do better. Okay, what are you going to do better? Well, everything, it's just going to be better. So if we don't take the time to stop and look back at what didn't work, we can't change it as we move forward to the future. We'll make the same mistakes. We'll be building on a weak foundation in our lives. Now, our final, final reason that we're going to look at is this. It's to be reminded to worship. And there is actually a passage. I'm not just making this up and then saying, hey, here you go. It's church. I've got to fit worship in there somewhere. Um, we're actually going to refer to a song that Keith started leading here probably about six years ago. And it was called Psalm 145. Believe it or not, it's from the Bible. Um, specifically, Psalm 145. I know it's a shock. And now you're seeing Sam's sense of humor. But... Um, Psalm 145, if you take a look at it in verse 1 through 2. What was that, Keith? Oh, I'm, oh. I'm happy that Bill knows what he usually knows a song by his name. Oh, he does that. <laughs> he knew that one. Hey, good job, Bill. I thought you were going to tell me, no, it's not really based on Psalm 145, and I was going to feel like a real idiot. <laughs> like, no, I know, I see the words. No, Psalm 45, 1, 2, it says this. It says, I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever. And then as we look at the reasons um, to, to, to see that why we praise, so, so first is, is we see that we're reminded to worship, but why? He says things like, one generation commends your work to another, and I will meditate on your wonderful works, and they will celebrate your abundant goodness. That's all in Psalm 145. So part of the reason that we need to pause and look back on what has happened is to remember what God has done for us and to celebrate and worship for what He has brought us through. Now, I, I truly am wishing the best for everybody in this next year. And I know some of you have been through some real hard stuff in 2023. And I truly hope the next year is better. And I'm not telling you to shove it all under the rug and pretend it didn't happen because that would be bad advice. Instead, what I would say is reflect on it and let's build from it. So as we look ahead to 2024, and as you make your plans, and we'll talk more about that next week, but as you look ahead to 2024, I want to encourage you to take a minute, even today, and reflect back. Reflect back and be encouraged. See relationships that might need to be addressed. Learn from the past and be reminded to worship Him for all He's done. Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you in your faith journey. To hear our messages live, head to one of our physical campuses. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com or email us at office at therescuechurch.com.